I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. We've had a lot of trouble with the audio in the Mr. Black interview, so what I did was to print a written transcript of it, and I had to painstakingly go through it word by word and make whatever corrections needed to be so that the interview was uh, verbatim. And I sent it to our reader, Jeff, and he's completed the first portion of that. It's a 30-page interview, and he's done about a third of it. So um, it turned out very well, and the following is that first session. So don't expect any you know, grand statements in the beginning of this interview. Mr. Black did two hours with us, and we're going to be doing much more where he gets deeper into the topic and what uh, what he learned during his time in the position he worked in. So without further ado, folks, this is the first segment of the Mr. Black interview. The following is an audio transcript of an interview conducted by William Jevening with an individual simply known as Mr. Black. This is his account. I've been talking to you for around 10 years now, and I originally contacted you when you were with another podcast because there was some information on there that I felt needed to be cleared up a little bit. And because of your background and my background being very similar, that's why I contacted you and not anyone else in this field over the subject. And I'll start out with a little background on me. I went into the military in the 1980s. I went into that program not really knowing what I was getting into. And when I got there, we dealt with the Soviet side, the military. What we did is we would get Soviet equipment from around the world and basically tear it down, analyze it, put it back together, and test it against our own people and play war games with it. And the areas on the West Coast, anybody that's been in service could probably tell you where this is. And we had a couple of different locations, and one of them was on test range north of Las Vegas. And we had quite a bit of stuff that we would do on an ongoing basis. And this falls into your podcast because I'm going to start bringing things up and I want people kind of a background on what went on between the U.S. and the Soviets in the Cold War era. And especially starting in the 1950s was the little U.S.-Soviet games would play with each other. I'll give you a quick example. The Soviets sent a drill bit over to the U.S. that was supposed to be the finest, the smallest drill that ever made. But six months later, they get the drill bit back and they're like, Okay, please send it back. And through channels, it was said, look at it closer. It has a hole drilled in it. And it did. And these are some of the things that went on back and forth between the U.S. and Russia. And this whole Cold War stuff was really interesting because we would go steal their stuff and they would steal our stuff. And this equipment taking went on back and forth. And it was a big game like the shell game. Back in 1954 or 55, A report came in that the Russians had created these quote-unquote super soldiers. If you've seen any of the TV shows about this, where they were trying to graft the head of a chimpanzee onto a human body, they were trying to create this super soldier that would not need rest, had the strength of six to ten people, endurance just out of this world, and they would be able to go in the areas, blend into their environment, and be able to spy or do anything that they needed to have done, do it quietly, get in, get out. Well, these reports started surfacing that they had created these super soldiers, and the reports that came in said that these things resembled what we today call a Bigfoot. And that was never technically proven that they had done it successfully. But around 1958, they started, the government started this whole Bigfoot thing and having it put into the news. And like the first set of tracks that were ever published in a newspaper went on, Jerry Cruz tracks, Bluff Creek, 1958. And the reason they did this was because they were not quite sure if Russia had been successful at this program or not at this time. So they wanted to start getting reports of if somebody, anybody, saw anything like this. Now, there have been reports of this stuff, hundreds of hundreds of years, and the government knew that. 
but they wanted to get reports of these things around populated areas, around stuff dealing with military, with manufacturing goods for the military, power generation, water supplies, so on. So they started pushing this. And then what they did by doing this is they also did a basic reverse psychology deal where they did say, oh, you know, you saw something like that, you're crazy. You're just, you're crazy. But they also did the same program with the UFO subject because the Russians were seeing UFOs. And so the United States, they were trying to blame it on each other. And so this, the Bigfoot subject, just started taking off. And reports started coming out and more people started coming forward. And back then, it was a lot of people worked in very, very remote areas. Well, this place that I worked at, they had a file on that subject. And after I've been there for a while, I was able to start looking into reading some of the stuff and seeing some pictures, seeing some of the reports done, not only by civilians, but by the military themselves. And this subject was a heck of a lot deeper than I thought it was. Because when I went in, I never thought that I would ever even begin to deal with something like this. And I had a sit down with my boss one time. We got into a very in-depth discussion about this subject. And he told me, he says, there are things that are kept in certain areas under military observation that you'll find out about later on. And we'll get into that later. But this, this subject really started kicking off in the 50s. And there were certain people who were higher up within the government. I'm talking about people that run the national parks. And the higher ups there had a policy that the worker bees were not allowed to talk about this, especially with the civilian population coming to visit. Any reports that were done, they wanted them to get a verbal report on it and then tell the people, no, that's not what he saw. But then able to go back and have to write a full report on it and running up the food chain. And these reports will go to an office in D.C., which is still in existence today. And then those reports would be where we were. And there was a small office of people that took care of that. And about six weeks ago, there was a podcast about a guy who was a special agent for the military. Part of his office actually handled some of that. But we would get things from different parts of the world by people that were deployed, because this isn't something that just happens here in this country. This goes on in Canada, Central America, South America. It's on every continent with the exception of, I've never heard of anything in Antarctica. But everywhere else, yes. Cold weather climates, warm weather climates, there was reports from all over the world. And for the number of years that I've been stationed at this place, I read through everything that I possibly could. And I know I didn't even get through half, but it was a very interesting subject to me. And once I got into the subject, then it just expanded from there. And we've worked with a lot of military intelligence people. We've worked with a lot of back then with the special operations, which was different than what we were doing, but we did work with them. And you know yourself, Will, from being in that your average guy on the ground up there is very well trained. They're very observant, and they will tell you exactly what they see. And we got reports from people throughout the military in almost every branch. I don't remember seeing anything Coast Guard but we got stuff from all the other branches of the service. And this went on for paperwork we had, like from the 1950s on up. There's lots of interesting information in there. One of the things that I want to talk about is this tree knock deal. And I've seen the guys on TV where they beat on a tree, scream and yell and do all that stuff. We never had one person in a report say they ever saw these things hitting a tree with a stick. That sound is made by their mouth is sort of like a clucking sound. We can do away with them. They're really massive, massive creatures. So they have, they're just incredibly powerful. And when they do the sound with their mouth, that sounds like a tree knock, but it's not. And anybody out there that can bring me a stick that they've hit a tree with, I'll give you 500 bucks. I've never seen it, never. And these sounds have been made in areas where there are no trees. The sounds have been made high up on mountains where above the tree line, and nothing. We had a report from a special ops team that above the tree line level here in the United States, training in on the Rocky Mountain states. And they kept hearing these in different directions, and there were no trees around anywhere. So this whole thing about the hitting the trees, I, for me personally, I think it's a bunch of bunk. Because I never read about it. 
and I've never talked to anybody that's ever done. Now, we had a lot of different reports from these people who first-hand encounters, and I got to read those that some of the younger people would write about. And just about every one of these people were like, I'd never heard of this thing. I had no idea what I was looking at. I never thought anything like this existed. People who had very religious backgrounds said it was some sort of demon from hell. Others believed it was some sort of ape. Others believed it was some sort of creature from somewhere else. But we had had them, and they were classified. I'd buy different categories. And you and I had talked about that, and I had told you about that back when you were on the other podcast. And that young man on there decided that he would be the one who comes out and says, all you know, this is a class. This? And this is this? Well, I'm the one who told you that, because that's how they were classified within the system. And within the classification, let's say we have a type 1. Well, under that are seven different subspecies, depending on geographical location. And that was never put out there. You never mentioned that in front of him. So he didn't have all the information on that, but these things vary greatly depending on geographical location. They'd still been thought probably up to about 1965. That's possibly still the Russian super soldier. Now the Russians had seen them also, but the Russians did not think that there's anything that we had done because there are people who live out remotely. They knew about them and the Russians have had encounters with them, even in Moscow. Parts of Moscow today that are part of the city back in the 1950s and 60s were swampland and not developed like it is today. And there were hundreds of encounters, especially farmers out there fighting with these things physically, having altercations with them because they plant stuff and it would grow really fast because of the way the ground is there. And these things would come in and try to steal the food. And Russian people are pretty tough people. They don't put up with a whole lot of crap. So they would just they would fight and sometimes they get killed sometimes they wouldn't and i know that the russians had killed several of these things because we had a couple of guys who defected from russia that i worked with and we got into a discussion one night sitting around drinking some beers about the subject and this guy told me he goes we have them too and they're real and they're part of the training and their survival training is what to do if you encounter these things It was very interesting. Their perspective on the whole outlook on it is nothing like it is here in the United States. Because here, it was always told, and it started at a higher up level uh, coming down, that if you say you saw something like this, you know, you could lose your security clearance or you could have a mental health evaluation. And you know, that could kill a guy's career in the service. You don't want to do that. And a lot of people just didn't want to talk about it. Or if they did do a report, at the end of it, they got the reasons. You didn't see what you saw and keep your mouth shut. And every now and then you'll get somebody who saw something years ago and they'll come forward and we'll talk about it today. Whereas they would never do it while they were still in the service. But with this subject, when they were doing the declassifications of them, they started grouping them together based upon the sighting and description of what is seen. So that's when they started saying, okay, this is a type 1, this is a type 2, type 3, this is type 4. Well, then they started finding out that they have these subspecies. And in some areas, the subspecies were very violent. And they would just as soon kill us and look at you. And I know that out on the West Coast, that story about the miners that are in the cabin that shot one of these things, these things basically tried to get them. Those out that way possibly are cannibals even way back. And I had gotten very interested in the subject, and I started thinking about it. Like, you know, I'll bet you those old trappers' journals have information in there about this. And so I started digging, and they sure do. There are lots of reports of these things. The Blackfoot Indians had a ton of reports of these things, and they have been passed on to different organizations and different people, even back, like, right after the army had basically stopped fighting and people are starting to live on reservations. They wanted to go in and get their information. And when they started finding out about this Bigfoot subject, which they timed, they were like literally very iffy subject. And the tribes, they're just like, it's a daily thing. We've interacted with these things for thousands of years, hundreds of years. That's just how it is. 
And I've said to you about going and talking to the Nez Perce because they used to winter in that massive canyon they have up there with these things. And they all seemed to keep their distance and space from one another, but they coexisted with them. Now, we had gone to different areas of the world bringing back this Soviet equipment, and I got to talking to some of the locals in different areas. I started bringing the subject up. My bosses, they don't want to do that. And I said, well, if we have information on it, I said, I wonder what they know about it. And in every part of the world, they have a name for these things. And they have stories about it, and it's mind-blowing to me that somebody, let's say in Oregon, is out hunting, and they see one of these things within 20 yards of it, and they describe it. And then a guy over in Afghanistan, a Mujahideen over there, describes the exact same thing. Same coloring, same features, same everything. They're not making this up. This is an actual creature, and the government knows this. And they've had, they've, they've been tracking this stuff for a very, very long time. They know what goes on. They've been tracking the UFO subject, which just came out not too long ago, and they know what happens. And it's awful bizarre to me. That was what I'd been reading. This BLM, Bureau of Land Management, was created around the same time that this subject really started being looked at hard by the government. Now, is part of that to keep areas where these things can thrive? I believe that it is. And from things that I've read, that is why I think the way I do now. Did I ever see anything in writing that says this was done because of this? No, I didn't. But if you read it and sit back and look at it, it basically tells you that without saying it. Now, when you were in the service, I know you said about having a few encounters with something. And the people that remember this correctly, the people you said that from the East Coast had asked you about that subject because they had never been around it. It was always presented as it was a West Coast thing, not an East Coast thing. But the stuff that we had, there was a lot of stuff on the East Coast. There's stuff in the Midwest. There were things that come from areas that you wouldn't even think of that these things could be near or around. You get out in the Midwest or it's very flat farmland as far as you can see. I mean, if your dog ran, we can see it for three days while it's running. And they have sightings of these things. They're here on the East Coast where I am currently. These things you've seen around larger city, not in any cities. But all that stuff that we had on them at that time, they had been seen. And this was after the 80s. They had been seen within probably 10 miles of a city limit. And out there on the West Coast, you know that there's a lot of rugged areas like Northern California. Your population isn't as big as like the city of Los Angeles if you're up in the northern part of the country out there. And a lot of these reports have come in from that area. And there was a, I need to, I need to word this properly without giving away too much, but there was a team of special operations that had encountered a small group of these things and they went back out with one of the 16 millimeter video recorders and they videoed these things. And they had like sticks and clubs. And they were sort of sparring with one another. Well, one of the guys that was in that was a very religious young fella and it didn't sit well with him. And when they got finished doing what they were doing, because they were out there for about eight days and they finished the video and sent it and we saw the edited version. Our Intel guys put the entire video together so well this young guy had sort of a nervous breakdown and had asked to be moved from there. So he got sent to the East Coast into a non-operational billet and he started drinking heavily. And about six weeks later, he took his own life. That's how bad it affected him. So the subject doesn't set well with everyone saying this with people who might be listening in the podcast or watching it on television or even just read about it. They're very curious about it. There's some people out there that cannot handle it if they actually did have something to watch. And that's part of the reason why they keep this so subdued in the public's eye, because they don't want public hysteria going on over it. Now, in the future, will it come out? Very possible. These TV shows that have come out in the last 10 to 15 years, I believe they're trying to break the public in and to do this just like they did with the UFO subject. Because all these movies that have gone on since the 1970s about the whole flying saucer deal and little green men and all that has been pushed in Hollywood and these TV shows where these guys are going out looking for creatures now, they are, I believe, that they're breaking the public in so that they don't go, okay, well, you know, you guys aren't actually crazy anymore. This is actually real. 
and it will probably will come out in our lifetimes. And I don't know because I'm not in that world anymore, but it will come out. I'm just, I'm just not sure when it's going to happen. I remember years ago, I told my parents about the whole UFO deal. I said, they'll come out with it in your lifetime. And my parents like, oh, there's no such thing. I'm like, okay. I said, I'm telling you. And when they came out with the government, I had a whole presentation on a mother like, oh my God, he was right. And they, they just didn't believe that the government would come out like that because for so many years they said, oh, you know, if you see something like that, you got something wrong with you. These things don't exist. There's nothing to it, right, on down the line. But this subject will come out eventually. I don't know what's going to happen. You don't want it's going to happen. That's all unknown. Hire ups to do all that. Now, some of the other things that you and I have talked about are different reports that people talk about as physical features. Traveling, we, we had proof that these things, about 80% have actually migrated, and they would close down the bombing ranges in the spring and fall so that these things, they call it range meat, and these things would actually pass on the range. And those ranges out there, they can tell you the jackrabbits, and they knew it went on. And they would just close it down and let it, do its thing for a week or so. And then they would open everything back up after it's finished and move on from there. But there have been different reports from people, especially people who work those fire towers. Now, there were multiple reports that even work with the fire towers for the park service. And they kept journals on everything that went on. And they were supposed to turn those in at the end of season. And then they would get hired back the following year. And then once it started getting dark, they would start foraging for food. They had certain areas that they would search for food. Not uncommon recording stuff as we're reading for them to travel 40 to 60 miles a night to do that. And then they would be in an area for a while, and then they would just move on to somewhere else. And there were many, many reports by people, also the firefighters with hearts, smoke jumpers, and people who just worked in park in general. And they wouldn't come out and talk to the public about it, but they would talk amongst themselves, and they would mention different things to their bosses. They would work its way up, and then the higher-ups would tell them, you know, don't let it out to anybody else about what actually took place. I do know that at Yellowstone and most of the other parks, they have a winter maintenance crew that will stay there, and they have problems with these things coming in during the winter months, breaking into cabins, taking food, people coming up missing, and hunters coming up missing. It's pretty incredible, some of the stuff that I got to read. And one of the guys that worked with me, he's still a great friend of mine, we talked about it once, and he was an intel guy. One night, we were deployed in the Middle East, and we got to talking on this subject. There was just three or four of us there at the site they call CSAR. Just that alert, in case somebody got shot down, we would go help. And we got to talking about this. We used to have these machines that you could pull up live imagery, and they used them a lot for targeting. And he said to me, he says, She knows there's a file on here marked Noah's Ark. I'm like, no kidding. And he goes, yeah. So he pulled it up and it was just a shot of something on a mountain. And you can see some stuff sticking out, but it was really snowing. And we were talking about the whole Bigfoot subject. And he goes, oh yeah, he says, there's pictures, really clear pictures. And so he pulled them up and these were taken in the Canadian Rockies. And here are four or five of these things standing there, sort of looked at like ones looking down, The other's one's looking out over the top now, and our imagery is very clear. Now, quick example. In the 1950s, the SR-71 could take a picture of a dime lying on the ground, and you could tell what year it was made, how many scratches are in the face. And the stuff that we had later on is better. These pictures were incredible. The amount of detail in it. And I remember seeing the thing about, I'm not going to mention his name, but the fellow in Canada always trying to promote himself. And he supposedly has pictures, videos of these things. And what he has looks like something somebody put together in their garage compared to what I saw. And there was no doubt in my mind that what I saw was actually the real deal. There's no doubt about it. There's no way someone could have had that level of detail in something then hundreds of miles from anywhere on the top of the mountain and have a satellite just shoot a picture. And there they are. We'd been up in Canada. And when we were up there for this thing called Naval Flag, and it lasts about six weeks, Groups from all over the world come in, and the aircraft come in. It's a pretty big deal. We were up there. We were in this briefing first day, and they brought a chief from the local tribe. 
The guy comes in, his entire briefing was about Sasquatch. One of the guys in the crowd starts cackling, laughing. He was a younger captain, and the chief walks over, stands right in front of him and says, do you think there's humor in this? And he goes, there's no such thing. And he goes, really? So he starts a slideshow presentation. And he started showing about people that had been found out that had been killed by these things. And he actually had a rifle there that he pulled out that isn't just twisted. There's no way you or I could have done this. This thing or this thing. It just wouldn't happen. And he told about what to do if you ran into these things. He says, this is very critical on how to not get hurt. He says, these things consider your hands a weapon. He said, if you encounter one of these things, do not look it in the eye. He said, you sort of tilt your head down to keep an eye on it, and you turn your palms out. If you have your weapon on you, you swing it over your back. You turn your palms out, and you just back away. You don't show any aggression whatsoever. Back out of there, and just start walking. And once you get where you feel comfortable, you turn to the side. We keep walking, but keep your palms where they can see them. And then you can turn your back and walk. And he said, anybody's ever done that has never been attacked. And I thought that was one of the most informative things that I had ever heard anyone say about dealing with them. Now, we had problems with them in certain parts of the country, problems with them at missile sites up in the Dakotas and Montana. It even got in behind the fences where the people are, where they stay in underground missile silos. And I got talking to a guy up there who was a cop, and they, they were back then, they were called security. We have security, law enforcement, these guys for security. I actually got to become very good friends with this guy after talking to him in depth about this. And he's like, who do you work for? And he ended up coming over to us, but he told me that they were inside a missile area and one of the alarms went off. And on the video, they could just see this blurry thing, but it was almost as tall as the fence. And this thing basically walked back a little bit and ran and jumped over the fence and was inside. Where they were, they were inside where the garage was and locked themselves in. And they had pictures. Their tracks are still there. And, and this was in the winter. And this wasn't the first encounter they ever had with them. They had a truck that flipped over. And the guy in the truck was damn near killed by one of these things. And there were a lot of things that went on. And in some of the areas, they have what they call PRP. And it has to do with the nuclear program. They happen pretty much on spotless record. They have to be able to be dependent. And they had these things go on. And if these guys get caught BSing anybody on it, they're off PRP as a big stain on your record. So they had to be honest about it. And they would tell about things that went on. They didn't fill out reports. Especially being rather nuclear stuff is pretty interesting. Because the government was then started wondering, what are these things doing there? What's going on with us? And no one had an answer. If they started taking the subject more serious, but... This was entire subject after the Cold War had ended, and then the unit got disbanded, and today it no longer exists. It's not there. But stuff that's left from it is now a museum, and museums now on Nellis Air Force Base. And mostly, they don't have anything in there that I know of about the Bigfoot subject. That had all gotten shipped out. And I have no idea where that went, because everybody that worked there when this Cold War ended you basically had your choice of assignment or where you wanted to go. And anybody who's been in the military will tell you that there are two sides of the military. You have logistics and you have operations. When they asked me where I wanted to go, I said I wanted to go somewhere on the operations side. So I went to operations. I'm not going to say where I went or what I did, but some of the guys that didn't want to go through the operations, we all have this experience. So they chose different career paths. I know a few of them that got out and actually went to work for the government in a different capacity. And when I was on the operations side, I went through a bunch of training then if I'm stationed on the East Coast. And I deployed a lot. And one of the times I was deployed, we were in a very rugged area. And we had these night scopes. And there was a small team of us on the side of a mountain. And we were supposed to be getting picked up the next day. And one of our guys, he nudges me, he says, you've got to see what it is don't move the scope, just look through the scope. And I looked through, and there was something that was about 14 feet tall. It was all black, it was covered in hair, and it's climbing the side of the mountain. This thing's going up like it's climbing that ladder, and everybody else wants to see, and our leader, he's like, what is that thing? And in these scopes, it'll give you a distance and tell you how big something is. This thing's just a little over 14 feet tall. 
Well, it started moving in it. It must have heard us or something because it started coming down the side of the mountain. And the team leader says, radio for a chopper to get it now. This chopper came and we got on there and we were lifting off and this thing was making its way to where we had been. And our door gunner guy was like, what the F is that? But there are areas over there that looks like it's a quarter mile away, but it might take you four hours to get there because it's so rugged. These areas are in a very high altitude area. This thing has covered the distance in about three hours. It's incredible. The amount of distance while the other guys had seen the same stuff also. And they had many, many, many of the locals tell them about these creatures being over there. And they talked about that when the Russians were there, that these things were more abundant and that human bodies would disappear and they would even get shot, whatever the body would vanish. And they thought that these things were actually taking them. And sources, food source, you're out there in the middle of nowhere like that for these, what are these creatures going to do? Eat whatever they can get. When we were bringing stuff out of the Middle East in the late 80s, when the Russians were over there fighting, we've heard reports from a lot of people over there about these things, but they have a different name for them than anything I'd ever heard. I can't remember what it is right now, but they, it's part of their culture. It really is. And the northeastern part of that country, they did call it the Yeti. They had another name, but these things, like I said, they're all over the world. We had reports from everywhere. And some of our guys even used to have conferences about them and bring back all the good information on file. It's pretty amazing what the government has and what they know about it. And I get a kick of these guys that talk about the government has this, the government has that. Like, yeah, they do. But why would they? Why would they need to tell you about it? Just because you know, just because you ask, you don't have a need to know. There's, and that's the whole thing with the government, you know. From being in the government... You only get the information that you need to know to do your job. And if this information doesn't pertain to you in your job, you're not going to get it. That's how our government does things. And I'm sure today there are two different agencies that are doing this. And I'm sure that they're both going to be listening to this podcast. And there are guys out there that are the people I used to work with. And they have scientists who are involved in this. And I know that in the 60s, there were a couple autopsies done. And I got to read a little bit about that and very interesting information. They're able to see these things that swear that they will disappear right in front of you. There are people who have had telepathic communication with these things. And I know that there are people out there that will laugh about that and think, oh no, that's funny. That would never happen. Blah, blah, blah. What I know, nothing would surprise me in the least. Absolutely nothing. Because there were reports that going way back, I mean way back, that these things communicate with different people as they do the song passively. And a lot of times the message that I got was to get out of the area. We're going to kill you. And there are people out there today that you and I have talked about who swear up and down that they're in constant communication with these things telepathically. And I will say this, I don't believe that they're all wrong. I do believe there are people that are able to do that with these things. Because there were some very credible people who had this happen that I'm not going to bring their names, but they were very respected, famous people in our military that if I told you their names, probably blow your mind. There's no way that they did. I read it. These are the non-terrestrial creatures, not the terrestrial ones. Now, on some of the other aspects of this, I'm trying to think how to do this without giving too much away. Because I don't want to say something that will point the finger in a certain area or a certain group where these people who are listening to this will go hound them and say, this guy said this, and then go to the wrong spot. But when these things have been seen, and they have been seen around different types of UFO, and I've heard different researchers say that all they hear something like that, they just blow it off. There's nothing to it. You shouldn't do that. One of the things that you should do is study the report and read as many of them as you can. And you will start to see a pattern with how things work, with how our people had done this to the point where some of these guys would read some of this stuff. And before they were finished, they would already know which classification of that was that that they encountered. It was patterns to the stuff, lots of patterns too, and also in different geographical areas. they are patterns to these things. Now yes, you and I are doing what we did in the service. If you and I started on the east coast of the United States, I know for a fact that you like to go to the West Coast and two of us on our own and never be seen by anybody. 
Now, if you and I can do that, these things can do that constantly because the entire country is their backyard and they are complete experts in the wilderness. They can blend in so well that you will not realize it's there. You can walk within feet of them and not realize these things have a tendency when they're seeing a lot of people to go, oh my God, it disappeared. If you had a drone and you were able to put it up over an area where this thing has been, I guarantee you laying down somewhere in a slight depression in the ground because that's what they do. They also use infrasound as a deterrent. They can also use that as a weapon. And these people who will go out and they'll say that they were walking along and suddenly had this feeling of dread, that is something that has been ingrained in us since we evolved. And a lot of animals have that. Lions have it. And our bodies sense that. And that's where we get that sense of dread from. And these things are able to project that out. And they use it to try and keep people away. Because, you know, if you're walking into an area and these things are there and they don't want you there, Rather than scaring you, they'll do this and you start feeling like, I really shouldn't be here, or I'm being watched, and you turn around and go the other direction. Then fine. But this is some of the stuff that we'll continue to do. Some I wanted to touch on also was this dogman stuff. Those, those have been seen forever. Now, some people can confuse the two because the different types. They look almost identical. And really, the only difference is their leg structure. And you and I have talked about that. Also, there are different areas in the country where these things were more doggish. There's areas where they look apish. They have faces, almost like humans. And lots of different stuff with geographical areas, like an East Coast. There's a version of those that they almost look emaciated. But don't let them fool you. Those things are super strong. They're fast. And they can run like the wind. But they look like they're wasting away to nothing. They're just subspecies of one type. And there's rounded heads as one, and one that has more pointed heads. And those are different subspecies, the different types. And I know that one of the other podcasts out there, that guy has done everything. He's seen everything, anything anybody else has encountered. He's had it happen to him, and is very full of himself, is what I think. And I know that he does get some good people, but you can't interject yourself into this. If someone's telling you about their experience... Because it's a lot of, for people, it's very, very traumatic. There are a lot of these reports. And in about 40% of a lot of these, people had to go on mental health. Just about everyone had to get mental health also ended up on different medications. And this isn't a joke. This is dead serious. And people that didn't really screw their lives up permanently. And it's people who used to enjoy the outdoors that don't enjoy the outdoors. Anyone. They will not go anywhere near camping. They're just, they, they have PTSD. They don't want anything to do with the woods. A lot of times they'll move into a city and move into a housing complex or something where there's nothing but people around. And they don't want pets. They don't want anything. Because their, their encounter was so traumatic to them. And this is something that's gone on for a very, very long time. And a lot of them won't even watch TV. I want to follow up on stuff that some of these people, especially in the 60s and 70s, a lot of that, and different three-letter organizations have been following a lot of these people because they thought some of them were communists, traitors, and yada yada. And they would keep close tabs on some of these people. There's people that committed suicide over this project. I mean, these guys that say, I'm going to go out and have encounters, they are out of their minds. You don't. Everybody reacts differently to it. They really do. They don't. Human body or your mind, I should say. I learned this from a scientist I worked with. He said the human body and your mind cannot comprehend something unless it's used to it. And one of the examples he used was when Europeans first came to this country and there was a ship that was docked and most of the people in the village couldn't see it. But this medicine man, he had a dream about it and he took a dugout canoe and went out to the thing. But the other people couldn't see it because their mind couldn't comprehend it. And that's something that that's been in different reports where there's been a crowd of people who have seen one of these things, like it's worse, and 30% saw it, 70% didn't. It's not because it vanished, it's because their mind couldn't comprehend. And we had some very, very smart scientists. These guys were top shelf, and I'm going to give you a quick example. We got a call about something that was dug up somewhere in the world, and we flew there to retrieve what had been dug up. And when we got there, the scientists were doing their part. It was already two of them there. And we were in an underground chamber that had been put there six, 8,000 years ago. 
this is nothing that we did. This is something that was done probably around the time of the Egyptians. And I got to talking to him after being done with what we were there to do, with everything being boxed up and sent back. And I said to him, we have all these lights down here. And how the hell did they see down here without these lights, without this stuff? And he said, there's no oil residue on the ceiling. There's no fire residue. There's nothing. And he says, come with me and I'll show you. We went down and took a couple of different hallways. And all of a sudden, it was like this blue like light. But it wasn't a directional light. It was just lit up. But it had a blue cast to it. And there were these glass globes on the wall. And I was like, that's a light bulb? And he goes, yeah, sort of. So what the hell is that? And he told me, he says, what these are is they would take some bacteria from a swamp and they would take that and like a dead lizard, a baby snake or something like that. And they put it inside this glass globe thing that they had and inject the bacteria into it. And as the stuff fed on this decaying matter in there, it would give off a light. And he said, when they first did them, he said they were probably very bright. But he's like, that's how all this stuff was lit up. And I was like, wow, that's like pretty cool. But we got to see a lot of bizarre stuff across the world. This is the end of part one of the interview with Mr. Black. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.